Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, Todd, I do expect that we're going to have uh, a couple of additional customers logging in here shortly, but um, we'll start the process here. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to Fromm's webinar in coordination with Rockwell Automation uh, about optimizing food and beverage manufacturing with cutting edge technology. And today we're going to explore how intentional design can enhance your production operations and build a durable infrastructure for future growth. Uh, there's going to be insights around workforce empowerment, production optimization, risk mitigation. And our speaker today is Todd Gilliam, who is the North American industry leader for consumer packaged goods at Rockwell Automation. He has over 35 years of experience in manufacturing software, industrial automation, and consulting services. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Todd at this point. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat in Teams and I will pick them up and uh, we, can, we can ask Todd. He's happy to answer questions during the presentation. So Todd, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Michael. Just a quick sound check, I'm coming through okay? Yes, sound good. Okay, yeah, and I'm thrilled to be part of this, and I really thank the Prom team for inviting me to be part of this uh, presentation. It's really a topic that has been front of mind with uh, a lot of our customers, especially since uh, the pandemic and you know things that are continuing to affect really everyone in the operation. And so, uh, as Michael said, if there's questions, please chat them in or please speak them in. I want this to be uh, as informal as we can. Uh, thank you for taking this time out of your day to spend with us. I'll try to keep it to around 45 minutes or so and leave time at the end for a Q&A. But again, if there's uh, something compelling during uh, my conversation, uh, please, please either chat it in or, or ask it. Um, just a quick overview of the agenda. I'll, I'll give an introduction of myself and, and what we do here at Rockwell Automation with regard to food and beverage. And then we'll set up the context of why is this an important topic, really kind of the challenge statement that we hear over and over from producers like yourselves. And then what is our response as part of our industry segment team at Rockwell? What, how, what are we doing to you know, affect change in these areas? Um, then I'll get into an area called designing for optimized smart manufacturing. That's a big statement, but we'll break that down and give some examples. Talk about something called use cases, um, what those solution examples can actually solve in terms of business outcomes. Uh, and then everyone always likes a few practical examples or some ideas that might spark um, interest in how you might begin this process. And then again, as I said, I'll leave Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, uh, I'm your host today in terms of the uh, presentation content. My, again, as, um, as Michael introduced me earlier, um, I look after our consumer packaged goods segment for North America at Rockwell Automation. So what does that mean in uh, consumer packaged goods as we define it breaks down about 85% food and beverage, which is the lion's share. And the other part is household and personal care, but there's some very common um, uh, ground between those two segments. And if you look here on the lower right, food and beverage uh, in terms of Rockwell's uh, account coverage is the largest by far. You see it's uh, relative to our other segments here in the chart. Uh, it represents globally about 22% of our overall business. And so um, that's a big um, uh, list of clients and producers like yourselves that we work with. And there's a there's a statistic here at the top that um, um, gives some visibility into that in terms of when, when I frame these suggestions and ideas and examples, they're really reflective of the entire um, space. We work with 100% uh, of the global Fortune 500. Uh, but we also recognize that the food and beverage market in particular is, is very fragmented, requires a full ecosystem. And when we talk to our clients, um, and as Michael said, I, I've been in the industry, a, a, I, I hate to say 38 years now, uh, that, that number still, still is uh, astonishing to me when I say it out loud. Um, but really, the, the thing that I hear over and over is that what Rockwell's biggest value is, is the ecosystem, the partner network. 
it's the folks like from here who have really kind of been the uh, you know the the last mile in terms of the way we interact with our clients and producers. It's our OEM uh, machine builders. Um, it's our uh, EPC and system integrator partners, and it's the technology partners. But also, I'll, I'll note across the bottom here, it's the associations and the trade shows and the events and the community in which all of you operate and play every day. The things like PMMI, we're on the board uh, for the packaging um, uh, consortium, as well as participating in the in the uh, event Pack Expo. We are in the poultry and dairy and meat and, and baking shows uh, and associations as well. Um, and we like to you know, essentially serve as a member of, of your community uh, to help if you need introductions, to help if you need suggestions on people that we may work with within the network, because uh, we recognize that, you know, it takes an entire village to to help you succeed in manufacturing. And the, as I mentioned earlier, I want to kind of set the context for the challenge statement and why, you know, this is this topic of optimizing and, and doing things a different way within manufacturing have become so important. It's because the industry itself is going through what I would consider unprecedented change. You know, demand in the in the space has always been high and always been challenging, but certainly within the last several years, some of which the pandemic, you know, um, exacerbated. But these things existed with the pandemic, and they continue to be ever present after the pandemic. This is a a, a list of just things when when I sit with other. Um, executives of food and beverage producers. This is just a compiled list that we started putting together of things that we heard were being, you know, pressures that you're facing. And we've sort of bunched them and you may have different ones or you may rank them differently. But if there's one thing that I say it always boils down to is this statement, you know, more and more we hear the terms we have to do more with less. Uh, we have fewer people, they're, hard, they're harder and harder to find, they're harder to retain and recruit. Uh, we have to do uh, uh, operate with less downtime. Uh, downtime, of course, is when the dollar bill machine stops running and producing, and that's always bad. That's you know lost uh, lost production, lost productivity. Materials are more difficult to, to find. Uh, sometimes we have to change formulations based on what raw materials we can source or what that what raw materials uh, have the least amount of inflationary pressure. Uh, and then scrap, you know, you want to do it right the first time, increasing quality, reducing uh, waste and scrap. These are things that this macro theme that we hear over and over and over. And we've tried to frame our response to that as like, how can we help you do more with less? And so when we say those that that more extensive list that I showed earlier, if we boil them down into, you know, the these top challenge categories, these are the five that keep coming up over and over. And we've we frame the, these they're in no particular order, although sometimes they do show up in this order, is by and large, the number one has been workforce. And you know, I referenced that earlier. Uh, this is the top. In fact, if you added all of the challenge statements up that we hear from most of our producers, this one is more than the other four combined in many cases, is that labor is, is difficult to attract, to recruit, to retain, um, to train, uh, so, how, you know, more and more that becomes the biggest challenge. We hear stories about requisitions that don't even get responses, perhaps, or that workers that just go AWOL without any kind of um, uh, advanced notification, but yet you still have to produce the, uh, the, the production demand, whether you have the resources or not. That never changes. Uh, the second item is operational complexity. The proliferation of SKUs and formulations and package sizes uh, is much larger. They're used, you know, the story 10, 15 years ago was we ran this particular recipe or formula on this line all day long in the same package size, and we did it 24-7, 365. More and more, you know, as you know, the, the demand is shorter runs, uh, more frequent changeovers, uh, a variation of different um, dietary restriction uh, SKUs that we have to adhere to, package sizes that are that are maybe smaller or larger or different form factors, uh, but yet we have to do it on existing assets. You can't build a new greenfield or a new new line uh, every time the consumer demand changes. You have to to 
adjust and be as flexible as you can on existing assets, some of them that can be decades old, right, and different vintages. Uh, third one, uh, no surprise, supply chain and market volatility. Sometimes you have to change the recipe. Sometimes you have to change the the suppliers and the sourcers based on what you can get available. Certainly that was uh, aggravated during the pandemic years, but it hasn't completely gone away, as you know. Um, fourth, the ITOT, if you're not familiar with those terms, it's information technology, operational technology uh, the lines are blurring as more and more networks start start to bleed into the manufacturing plant floor. Certainly when you get into things like cybersecurity and attacks, those are vulnerabilities that are different in the manufacturing world than, than they are in the front office world, for example. Um, but uh, more and more what we hear clients telling us is that they're, they don't want to necessarily be in the application integration business. They, ex they expect solutions to work together, to adhere to common standards and protocols, and and work uh, to integrate horizontally as well as vertically, and then last but not least, you know, environmental and sustainability concerns, uh, especially with water reduction. Water is a big ingredient in most food and beverage products, if not the number one ingredient. Sometimes, uh, being a better steward of of the environment and the communities in which you operate and produce is certainly top of mind. And so when we say what our response to that is as a manufacturer ourselves and as a supplier to the manufacturing community, we want to respond to that in a way that can help you address those challenges. So going back to the earlier chart, if workforce is your biggest issue, we need we as Rockwell need to provide solutions and and um, as well as you know our partners like from that help you empower workers, right? Give you more, um, uh, capabilities for the ones that you do have, the ones that are showing up, the ones that are sticking around and staying, capturing the knowledge that they bring to the table, the tribal the tribal knowledge about how you operate or refine a process, giving them that information and in digital work instructions, leveraging uh, uh, technology to help uh, do more with less, uh, to optimize workflow, to streamline efficiencies, to perhaps uh, supplement or replace um, uh, labor resources through uh, automation, through uh, robotics, things like that. So empowering, giving more, giving more value to the ones you do have. Second one, if you say the operational complexity is a concern, then solutions on our side um, should help optimize that to help to help provide more with less. Uh, in terms of uh, production management, giving better visibility into the operation. We hear that frequently of I don't really have full um, transparency or visibility into the production process itself. I'm not sure I, I can make production. I think I can. Uh, sometimes I'm hoping I can, but giving better visibility in real time decision making authority to the people that you have. Next one is around yield, optimizing the yield in terms of getting the most um, juice out of the lemon or the most, you know, uh, uh, content that you can so that you're not either losing product through scrap or waste or giving too much away uh, in the event of uh, just lack of, uh, of capability. And then last but not least, the biggest piece, of course, is leveraging the existing assets you have. Uh, we, we, a lot of times we spend... Uh, uh, some early assessment um, cycles going through uh, plant floor walkthroughs with clients and just finding out that things aren't necessarily leveraged in the optimal way. So making the best use of the existing assets, of course, is top of mind. Um, and then next one is around risk. Um, if you say that, you know, the, the volatility or the um, uh, supply chain constraints are a concern, how can we help you uh, manage existing risk and pr ultimately protect the brand. The brand with food and beverage, of course, is very critical. Uh, people buy from brands that they trust and they um, they are, um, are are certain that are are good brands to associate with. And so things like you, the safety of your resources, right? We want to protect the the existing personnel you have. We want to protect the product from contamination events. Uh, no one wants to be on the front page for a uh, a listeria or salmonella type of uh, contamination um, or a recall that, that's a result of that. And then finally, the same thing with cyber attacks. Uh, 
Uh, we see more and more of these sto these stories of ransomware attacks in in even smaller and smaller uh, food and beverage brands. It used to be the big guys, and now they're slowly moving down the pecking order to find vulnerabilities. So all of those things go to the protection of the brand. And so when I when I uh, uh, start reviewing these with clients, many say, "Well, can you give me a few practical examples?" Um, and before I get into the examples, I'm just going to do a quick pause here to see if any questions have come in uh, that Michael and Madison can can monitor here. If there's anything that we should address now before moving into the examples. I don't see anything at the moment, Todd. Oh, OK, great. Again, please, if if you do want to chat something in, uh, feel free. You you I'd like to keep it, you know, uh, in terms of an interactive dialogue. So the examples, you know, and this is where I referenced earlier of, of some folks will say, well, talk about empower workers, for example, or optimize production or managing risk. What does that look like? So what I'll share here, this is a bit of a prototypical overview or cut, cut away of a uh, of a typical food and beverage facility. This is, you know, just a, a fictional example of a of a uh, in this case a bakery, which we have some areas over here on the left hand side, which are doing some batching, mixing, blending, forming, uh, moving into a oven uh, section that's being heated and cured and then moving out to uh, some flexible packaging areas over into uh, tray packs, uh, shrink wraps, and then out into the warehouse uh, for shipment. And you'll see some various what we call use cases that are highlighted here that just give you an idea of when we talk about leveraging technology to do those things like I showed earlier, that th th this gives you an idea of what that looks like. And I'll just drill down a little bit in each of those categories that I shared earlier. So if you say, well, show me uh, what you mean when you talk about empowering workers. I agree that I need to give more information or give more value to the existing resources that I, that I do have, but what does that look like? So you'll see we've highlighted you know, in this same cutaway view what are some examples of empowering workers and things that are shared here like flexible changeovers, that ability to kind of, you know, do things quicker with existing assets, upskilling the workforce that I do have, material handling technologies, things like that. And some examples very specifically, I'll just kind of go through here for empowering workers. This one is called workforce upskilling and, and the technologies that sometimes you'll hear referred to here are things like augmented or virtual reality or their um, acronym AR or VR. You'll hear about that sometimes of how can we use these augmented or virtual technologies to give the worker more information about how to operate the equipment, digital work instructions. The newer generation, of course, is familiar with uh, like consumer devices like phones and tablets. Uh, even wearables now that can basically be basically be used as either digital instructions through things like video work instructions, through annotations or overlays, through augmenting the existing equipment with a playback that they can see in their glasses or on their tablet. And this is becoming more um, important in terms of leveraging the workforce to train them who may not you know typically want to go to a big binder but they will watch a two minute video uh, to see how things operate. They can learn much quicker, quicker visually, as well as the ability to partner with OEM suppliers to do remote troubleshooting or to do digital catalog instructions through that technology. This has become a, a very typical example of how we upskill existing workforce. We capture existing tribal knowledge through those work instructions. Um, and this has been you know, maybe five or six years on the plant floor, but becoming more, more ubiquitous. Next one is in the area of autonom autonomous material handling, also, also referred to as AMRs. Uh, you may have heard of AGVs, automatic guided vehicles, which typically operate in a very uh, you know, uh, uh, static uh, or, or a structured pattern. Whereas with AMRs, and the example here is an acquisition that Rockwell did last year of ClearPath Robotics and in a particular uh, division of that called Auto Motors, which provides AMRs that could basically be like uh, forklift replacers that can operate autonomously regardless of the track. They can move around existing obstacles, 
could certainly be be uh, operated safely with existing resources that might be in the uh, in the shipping or material handling area. Again, becoming more important because, as we said, those uh, existing resources are are harder, or more difficult to uh, find and retain. Um, Next one is in the area of robotics. So uh, things like unified or collaborative robotics of having the ability to leverage robotic technologies, but in a, a platform that you're familiar with, in this case, like our Control Logics uh, programmable controller platform, you want to be able to uh, leverage the comfortable languages and knowledges that you're required to um, operate the equipment, but integrate or incorporate the ability to use robotics in a way that doesn't doesn't require you know specific knowledge about that robotic we part we partner with with uh the many of the leading robotic providers again helping uh automate the the um the difficulty out of some of the processes especially with regard to uh if you if you can't find the uh, phys uh the physical labor resources to do certain uh tasks um, and then next is around the, what I call leveraging information or data to make better decisions in real time. So the ability to say, um, I need to uh, have that that better, you know, uh, picture about can I make production and how can I make production? And I need to know it today, not yesterday. I, you know, I don't need a report necessarily. We don't have customers that ask us for reports about how they did yesterday or last week. Uh, because the product is too late, right? Maybe there's been some scrap or waste that's already occurred and you want to get ahead of that in real time. So getting that right information to the right person at the right time for their role to make better decisions. And so that visibility through either things like our optics, uh, HMI uh, software, or the ability to aggregate data from different sources through data mosaics. Um, this is becoming more and more important about uh, the giving the uh, you know uh, workers the ability to do more value add types of tasks as opposed to just repetitive motion tasks. So that's the example of empower workers. If I move to the next section about some practical examples of optimizing production, you'll see some other ones highlighted here of things like yield optimization, advanced process control. Uh, intelligent conveyance, you know, that ability to kind of do more with less with the existing assets uh, to get the most product out the door. First one is an example of on the more on the packaging side or the, the, the material handling or conveyance side, something called uh, independent cart technology. Maybe you've heard of this. Uh, our our uh, Rockwell um, uh, solution is referred to as iTrack or MagnaMotion. It's the ability to do a bit of a variable pitch um, variable um, conveyance that's not the traditional um, conveyance mode where the you know one item is dependent on what's in front or behind it. It's the ability to, to monitor through independent uh, um, like a linear motor type of solution that can increase the throughput and that's ultimately the goal. It can also give you much more flexibility to, of how you adapt to certain package sizes uh, the ability to do things like variety packs. We see that as a common use case of we want three of this particular SKU and three of that SKU, for example, soft drinks or alcoholic beverages that can go into a variety pack. And it's the ability to, to have a lot more freedom over the way you put together uh, the packaging line, almost like a Lego type of arrangement. So that's that's becoming more common, especially with some of the OEM suppliers who can help enable that type of technology for you. Another area which is more on the front end of the design piece, and it's certainly uh, a buzzword that's getting a lot more traction. You may have heard the term digital twin. So what a digital twin gives you the ability to do is to better anticipate through the use of simulation or emulation to, uh, to determine how things will operate under an actual physical load. So you can do it in a virtual environment first. You can do testing uh, you can run what if scenarios to determine speeds and throughputs and whatnot. Um, and Emulate 3D actually has a very strong community through our system integrator community partner. Uh, there's a users group that supports this as well to provide that virtual um, emulation uh, capability so that you spend uh, less time doing actual startup and commissioning 
And you also have a better input into like how many operators it might take to op to run the line, uh, what the throughput range could be, what the you know potential could be if we operate under various uh, circumstances. And that's becoming you know more of a way to leverage that sort of you know virtual world, uh, things like edge computing and and uh, and uh, virtual um, uh, technology to to you know reduce that actual um, in production commissioning uh, startup time. Uh, more on the uh, the yield side, I referenced that earlier in the uh, optimized production slide. Is that ability to optimize the yield through things like um, either batch production so that you can um, you know compare a number of parameters that go into the mixing, the batching, the blending, the cooking, the recipeing, all of that to compare to previous versions of a batch. We call that golden batch analysis. The golden batch would be that day that you did it perfectly and would like to replicate and repeat as, as closely as you can uh, in every run, the ability to kind of do that through through software uh, technologies through not only batch, but through things like analytics uh, to compare versus previous uh, runs, also to run some what if scenarios, to tighten parameters, to dial in greater accuracy through something we call model predictive control uh, to you know ultimately increase production capacity uh, and to get the most out of the out of the uh, process as you can. A um, a related example is through something called Logix AI, and this is the example here that we use uh, sometimes for food and beverage is called Perfect Fill. So the ability to um, reduce giveaway, as you know, many times uh, uh, our food and beverage uh, client producers actually put more in the package than is required for the label because they want to make sure that they have at least the minimum label uh, volume uh, in the um, in the container. Um, and so many times that's, uh, you know, that's conservative and, and more product is, is given away than is required because of the ability to have high confidence you can dial that parameter in as closely as possible. So things like leveraging AI technologies and soft sensors to reduce that amount of giveaway and slowly dial it down to as close to the um, to the label uh, volume as as possible is 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 increasing yield and delivering uh, return on investment for many of our clients at a very low cost point cost point and pr and price point um, that is uh, is quite easily to to uh, uh, deploy in a very common platform again either through the uh, module that's uh, available in the control logics platform or an edge type of device. Um, so those are some optimized production examples. Uh, so now I'll move into more of the, you know, how to manage the risk side of the equation. And so when you get into risk, uh, some examples here, of course, are things like employee safety, uh, uh, brand integrity, asset management, and cybersecurity. So you want to protect that brand and lower the risk. And really the first thing that I would highlight here is people safety. Again, you know, this not only is it is it a good thing to do, but you know, especially when, uh, as we say, workforce is already a challenge. Just the ability to protect the resources that you have in terms of uh, safety devices. You know, we have a very broad portfolio of not only safety PLCs, but sensing devices, relays, switches. You know, safety uh, connection systems, as well as just things like lockout, tagout services. I know Fram provides those those types of uh, expertise services as well. Uh, these are just really kind of that first line of defense in terms of protecting the existing resources you have uh, from from harm. Um, the next area would be you know protecting the uh, food, the food safety aspect of it, things like um, using stainless equipment, washdown or hygienic or IP69 uh, devices uh, so that you minimize the the risk for bacteria and contamination by nature of the products you you know effectively uh, you try to achieve the goal of designing out um, the contamination uh, threat through the use of technologies that uh, that you have either in the hardware devices there's an example of a IP69K HMI panel uh, things with um, uh, that are smoother stainless types of of services, that's that's the first line of defense in helping provide 
uh, food safety. The next would be through things like having the ability to do product genealogy or traceability in the in the event that there is a contamination uh, occurrence, the ability to minimize it um, and to respond quickly to it so that you provide either the uh, the quick uh, product recall or the information required for uh, the regulatory agencies like FDA, USDA, OSHA. Uh, I highlighted one here that's a new ruling uh, that some of you on the on the call may be affected by, which is uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act ruling 204. And so what this is, is about the ability to uh, provide uh, lot tracking genealogy information or traceability for a certain number of uh, food product categories. They, they, are, they are on what we call the food traceability list. And this has to be implemented by January of 2026. It's a uh, regulatory uh, compliance requirement that many of our clients who have products on that food traceability list are required to respond to. Um, if you're not aware of that, please reach out, you know, either uh, after the call or during the chat to figure out um, if you are affected, we're glad to, you know, have a separate call and figure out, you know, if you're covered on that, if not. Um, and many of our clients, you know, are also just doing that because it's a good idea to have the uh, traceability both forward and backward uh, in the result of uh, contamination event. Um, the other other areas around I talked about this earlier of making use of existing assets, which could be, you know, various vintages. Many of our producers have uh, multiple plant locations, some of them um, that they've they've uh, gained through acquisition. And so they may be various vintages. They may be various platforms, not always a, a, a Rockwell install base. Sometimes it could be other uh, providers, but the ability to kind of understand what's uh, in the existing uh, asset or install base. It can start uh, with something as simple as an install base evaluation to figure out where the uh, risks and vulnerabilities are uh, and go all the way through things like uh, having an audit trail for existing assets, uh, solutions like Asset Center to, uh, to understand what's in, the, um, what's in the facility as well as how they're connected together and networked, uh, things like um, uh, computer computerized maintenance management uh, software that can track and, and dispatch work orders in a predictive or more prescriptive maintenance way as opposed to just reactive or break break fix type of mode um, as well as just using uh, other uh, digital technologies like I, I highlight here guardian AI which is the ability to kind of understand some condition based um, solutions that might lead to a downtime occurrence or a lead to a, uh, a maintenance concern. Um, this has become probably one of the biggest areas of our um, engagement with food and beverage clients because as we as we shared early, many of them have you know assets that can that are quite old. Uh, you know one of the one of the advantages uh, of our Rockwell or Allen Bradley uh, platforms is that they do last a long time. Uh, but some of them can be 30, 40 years old. Uh, and you want to know, you want to have some some idea about life cycle management, obsolescence management, if things are either facing sunsets or that, you know, you may be in a particular case where in the event of a downtime occurrence, uh, it may take a long time to replace that or to deploy that quickly. So getting better ideas about how to be more proactive in that approach um, is kind of an easy starting point. And then last but not least, this area of kind of cybersecurity, you know, this is no longer just a, um, a, a theory that only affects the big guys or the big financial institutions. More and more, in fact, we, we hear about practically every week an event in food and beverage manufacturing where someone has been attacked through a vulnerability uh, in the plant floor assets, right? A lot of times these assets on the plant floor aren't always patched the way they would be in a laptop or office environment. Um, they might be, again, as I say, 30 or 40 years old, and they're attached to a weigh scale uh, or an inkjet printer or barcode reader or something that you don't want to necessarily break that connection. But by not upgrading or not patching or not, you know, kind of taking the proactive approach on that, 
uh, you you open up the opportunity for a, a an attack vector and a vulnerability that can you can take those assets down. We've seen it over and over and over. And this is when we talk about cybersecurity at the OT or operational layer, we feel like, especially with our partnerships that we've put in place with folks like you have here on the uh, the slide, that we bring probably the most to the table is in, in terms of understanding how those operational assets work and what the potential risks are. So the ability to kind of go through and make sure that you're protected, uh, you have not only threat detection um, uh, you know, uh, services in place, but incident response. Uh, we can provide managed services as little or as much as you might wish to make sure that you're um, protected from those types of attacks. And so those are just, you know, some quick examples. I, I walked through those fairly quickly, but if you have questions or you want to dig deeper, or explore any of those in greater detail, of course, that's the goal of this call is if, if something sparked your interest, please reach out. We're glad to kind of do deeper dives. Uh, at your specific level to determine if there's a, a, a fit or match of, of what we discussed. But sometimes, you know, we get the question of like, well, those are great examples. I'm not quite ready to, to jump into the pool on those use cases yet. So how would I just start the process? How would I begin? And that's, you know, I would say probably one of the most common first questions that we get is like, give me an idea how to start right before I before I go down a journey. And as we say, you know, with any journey, the, the first step is always understanding where you are currently. You know, if you think about in terms of applications that you use on your phone, almost all of them start with where are you? What's your location? Um, and then I'll give you an idea how to how to get from from point A to point B. And so that first level, we say, is determining the and doing an honest assessment of where you currently are. This is an example of uh, what we call a digital maturity curve of 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 where every plant falls in in one one area or another on the spectrum where you may have certain plants that are at one level or a phase and, and others that are another level but they could be you know starting all the way at the lower left in terms of like what we call a pre-digital or manual plant um, these are again mostly uh, either some form of automation maybe they're you know plcs maybe some basic level automation but there also might be spreadsheets, there might be clipboards, you know, they could be various levels of, of uh, information availability. Uh, moving into phase two, the digital silos, and this is probably, as you see, you know, in, in the in the red block here in the in the upper or upper middle, is that when we poll and when we've done assessments with most food and beverage organizations, we found that many of them are somewhere between one and two. And so don't feel bad if you're at one or if you're at two or if you're not up at five, like an adaptive plant, that's what everyone's aspiring to be. But most we see kind of in the, you know, the lower left portion of this continuum. But what we are seeing, and as highlighted in the green uh, dotted line here, is that we're seeing increasing momentum, especially with food and beverage, of moving up this uh, curve, especially with regard to those other challenges that I mentioned earlier. You know, many of our clients or saying, if I want to, you know, kind of be able to do more with less, I have to move up this curve. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And so the thing that we, you know, typically would start with is kind of doing that assessment of where where is your enterprise or where is your, your plant or group of plants currently? And then we can figure out, you know, what good or better or best might look like going forward and ways to do it in a, you know, um, in a manner in which your, uh, organization can absorb. And ultimately, the goal of doing this is to put together what we call a, a digital infrastructure in place. It's a you know, kind of building for the future is to say, hey, I can't do it all on day one. I recognize that. Uh, so start with the core. That's this, this area and the kind of the reddish orange down here. This is, again, where most of you probably uh, spend the most of your focus is, you know, of course, production, getting product out the door. Uh, meeting the uh, order demand. Uh, it's the core areas, which you've probably known uh, uh, us uh, for for many years, that automation and controls layer, the electrical and power layer, you know, the ability to kind of integrate into the existing OEM equipment that you have. And in some cases, you might have HMI or SCADA software on the top. And that's been in place. You know, of course, almost every plant has some level of that uh, core uh, foundational piece in place. 
But where we started to see, again, kind of, you know, talking at, at a holistic level to, to those earlier examples is this layer called the, the, the data or digital infrastructure, the green here, which is the first piece, putting that network together, making things, making sure things are connected, adhering to common standards, uh, protocols, uh, connecting, you know, but basically disparate levels of communication and network. Uh, into a layer that just you know uh, is is um, is the same because that's really the starting point, and then on top of that network layer, the building in that data and what we call contextualization layer to say if I can get everything connected and then start sharing data horizontally, then I can help you know contextualize it in a way that's meaningful. It's not just a tag and a PLC uh, or a register number in a device. It's, it's, it's information that can help me do my job. And then this top layer is the, you know, kind of the, uh, use cases that I talked about earlier, but the, the goal is if you do this, this digital layer in the middle and you do it in a way that's, you know, cyber protected, then whenever you're ready to turn on these applications in the blue level at the top, you can do them whenever you need, right? Cause you've, you've built the foundation, to support that. The analogy we've used is kind of like, you know, I've held this up a couple of times. It's kind of like the iPhone where you say, um, you know, I may not have an app that I'm that I need currently on, on the iPhone, but I, I might need it next week. Or when I do need it, I go to the store, I download it. And chances are it will work the way I expect it to because it was built and designed for the iOS platform. But I don't need it yet, but I eventually will need it. And it's nice to know that that app is in the store when I do need it, when my organization is ready to turn it on. So that's the kind of the mindset to say you, may, you can't do it all at one time. Right. You, you still have to make production. But when you are ready, you can add the things in a scalable way. You can leverage things like cloud technologies and and uh, and edge computing devices that that give you the, the ability to do it at your own pace and at your own uh, culture. Um, and so the last thing here, I say, well, okay, if you say, well, okay, I'm, I'm not quite ready to turn on the apps yet, but I want to start somewhere, right? And so we, I, I say, well, we can start with the ABCs and, and the ABCs here are, 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 you know, try to try to keep them simple in at least the first three rhyme. Uh, but the first piece is that connecting piece, you know, the ability to say, you know, more and more uh, things like uh, instrumentation assets are becoming uh, IP enabled. They're coming. They're becoming smarter. There's, you know, a broad ecosystem of partners that you can align yourself with. But more and more, you want those those ability to kind of adhere to those common uh, communication protocols. So start specifying. Start procuring products that are connected and build into that infrastructure. Even if you're not ready, you know, to to leverage them uh, to their fullest extent, at least they're ready and and they they adhere to the right technology so that when they are ready, uh, they can serve that data up, which leads to the, the next ABC collecting, always be collecting uh, that, you know, that once you get those devices connected, then they have the ability to share data in a way that uh, is a little more uh, understandable. It's a little more, you know, English language type of capability to provide that data into a larger um, either a uh, database or, or unified data model that can serve information again to the to that right person at the right time in the right role. The third one is the correcting piece, which means basically all that data that you, you're collecting from these assets or devices isn't necessarily needed or or useful. In fact, too much data can be overwhelming. You want to get the right information. You want to constantly be and refining and tweaking and correcting the model so that um, you're not making everything a science project. It's more I need just just the just the critical and valuable information to serve up to the other applications. And then finally, uh, the contextualizing the fourth C here is that contextualizing piece to say uh, for this particular role or use case, uh, what does that that data mean in terms of knowledge to do my job? And, and how does that uh, serve a, a larger um, use case? So I will pause here. I think we're right about the 15 minute mark here left uh, to address uh, questions. So I, uh, I went through that fairly quickly, but um, I wanna open the floor up here and I'd go to uh, 
uh, the from team to to help monitor any questions that may have come in or that that will come in here as we go to the Q and A section. Yeah, uh, Todd, we did get a couple questions. Um, so I'll ask these in the order that I got them. Um, the first one was related to robots or robotics. Um, how are robotics or robots being received by food and beverage manufacturers that have union environments? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And and, and I think it, it opens up a broader question. And this is question has really been around for years and years in terms of automation in, in its own context is that uh, many times the perception is that automation or in, the, in this example, robots are replacing human labor, right? They're you know, they're taking jobs, right? We hear that a lot. We've heard that for years of like, oh, okay, that's that's taking my job potentially. And, you know, the, the evidence over those same years, and especially with Roblox, has been very clear that they're actually pre creating jobs in many cases because in some cases, they're jobs that aren't safe to do for personal, you know, uh, physical resources, right? We're, we're kind of, again, going to that, that human safety aspect or personnel safety aspect under the managed risk piece is that we're, you know, essentially, um, you know, taking those sort of dangerous, maybe in this case, repetitive motion types of jobs, and maybe they're bad environments. You know, some of our food and beverage clients have uh, you know, freezer areas, they're cold or they're hot, you know, or they're dirty or they're just generally unsafe. And so, you know, the only way to do that effectively in a way that protects your, your labor is through the use of robotics. So that's one example of where, you know, where in many cases our, our clients are saying it's not really taking jobs, it's not affecting our union relationships. It's more of a way of like we're making jobs safer and we're making the worker uh, or the, the the plant floor environment safer for the workers. Uh, the other area that we we see uh, good adaption and absorption union or non-union is about the ability to provide, again, those higher value add jobs for the for the people that uh, that they are looking to work with. So, again, it's not that what I would call low fulfillment type of role, repetitive task, uh, those resources don't usually stick around very long because it's dreadful work, you know, and we're trying to give them better information. We're, we're trying to help these um, food and beverage, and, and this is kind of a, you know, a, a pet topic of mine of like making manufacturing a more desirable destination for, for labor. You know, we're competing in manufacturing, we're competing you know, against other jobs that, you know, are, are not, they're, they're more office related. They're, they're more, uh, I would say glamorous, uh, on the surface types of jobs. And we want to be a more attractive destination. And sometimes the, the attractive destination can be the, through the, uh, incorporation of cooler and, you know, more cutting edge technologies. So, um, you know, I had a, uh, a food and beverage, uh, uh, vice president tell me this a few years ago, and I think it's so relevant. I've, I've, I've stolen this quote from him is he would say, hey, 30 years ago, if, if we as workers wanted to be exposed to the coolest technology, we did that in our job. We did that in our workforce environment. And now today, the coolest technology is actually at home and it's in our pockets and it's in our devices. And we need to change that that paradigm. We need to make manufacturing a cooler place. Sometimes that's through the use of robotics. Sometimes it's through the things like, you know, I showed earlier augmented and virtual reality, uh, you know, consumer devices and tablets and things like that, wearables uh, to make ourselves a more attractive workforce destination. And if we play that correctly with the existing labor and workforce, it's 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 shown uh, to be true that that is, a, you know, a more effective use. And they do find that type of job more attractive. Kind of as an extension of that, Todd, it was also asked, are there additional safety concerns around robotics or automation integration um, and or how do these organizations that upgrade to those types of efficiencies deal with power outages? Yeah, and I touched on, I, I mentioned this topic very briefly, but I'll expand on it. So one of the areas uh, uh, when I showed the unified robotics slide and, and to a certain extent, the the autonomous um, 
material robot um, uh, slide is that uh, the area of collaborative robotics and it's sometimes referred to as cobots. Uh, and I'm actually doing an internal webinar for our team here on, on this topic on Friday of this week. This this, this technology or, or concept called cobots, which is the ability for these you know uh, robotic equipment to operate very close contact and in conjunction in, in basically in a collaborative workspace with humans. And so vast strides in technology over safety technology of those uh, uh, those devices over the past several years because of that need. You know, traditionally, if you went back 10, 15 years, a robot was often in a palletizing type of environment. Maybe it was behind a, a fence with, with some of those safety sensors that I showed on the earlier slide, light curtains, things like that. So if you break the uh, break the zone, the robot stops because it could damage you or, or, or cause physical harm or worse. Uh, so the ability to kind of, you know, leverage that uh, much more of that safety technology, especially the speed to stop the device in, in the event that, you know, a human wanders in or walks in, uh, is that that's becoming more and more common uh, to that type of solution. The AMRs I showed earlier, the auto AMRs, that's their biggest value. If you, if you go, like we were at a material handling trade show a couple of months ago, um, and the biggest advantage, or, or or what what our team from Auto would say, is it's that safety software that's built in, so that in the event of something does occur, it quickly adapts, it quickly stops, and so you 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 know you essentially have a safe in, environment to work in. Todd, one one last question: um, Magna Motion is that a product? or technology that is mainly used in liquid applications or can it be used in dry good applications? It could be used in both. Magnamotion was a uh, an iTrack uh, on the independent cart was an acquisition that Rockwell made a number of years back, but there's there's other uh, suppliers in the market that provide this kind of like independent uh, uh, cart uh, technology of material handling. It could be used for either or both. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, a lot of the technology that goes into from on the, on the liquid side is to minimize the the slosh aspect so that it doesn't you know it's it's like a very essentially the same concept is like a variable frequency drive of being able to tightly control that speed so it, it's neither it's not all on or all off it's the ability to move it very smoothly uh, but we've seen it in but in both contexts of whether it be a liquid or or a dry good or even just a uh, uh, a package uh, container or something like that, a can or a bottle or, or whatnot. Uh, so it's got some fairly broad uh, use case application. Of course, you know, part of the process of of integrating that technology is to is to study the the movement of the uh, product in question ahead of time so that you engineer it properly. But we I've seen both both dry and wet in terms of applications on that. Okay. Um, I think that wraps up our questions. The last item that somebody had asked me was, will this recording be shared? And the answer to that is yes. Um, anybody that registered for the webinar, including those, I know we have uh, an account manager out there on site with a customer that, that had many folks in the presentation or moving in and out today. So we will make sure that that the appropriate people there get that that presentation to share with with whoever they'd like. Uh, so yes, we will be sharing it. Um, okay, uh, Todd, anything else, or are we good? No, just I, you know, I put my contact information in here in terms of email, but uh, and and I represent a team here in North America, regardless of where you may be located. I'm sure we have someone that I could help connect in terms of a direct Rockwell contact. But please start with with our team at From, as we said, kind of like they're your first line of relationship. Um, they know how to reach me. If you do, if any of you had questions that you just wanted to dive deeper, um, you know, we are more than happy to, to respond in terms of a next level conversation. If any of these sparked an idea or raised additional questions after this call that you think of later and you think hey, I should have asked that, you know, again, we want to make this uh, uh, the first and hopefully would be a series of, of conversations with you. All right, thank you, Todd. Um, so I wanna thank everybody that joined the call today. I hope you found everything insightful. 
and hopefully you learn some things about ways you can optimize your food and beverage manufacturing operation. Uh, like I said, a recording will be shared with everybody who registered, and that'll allow you to revisit any part of this presentation at your convenience. If you have any additional questions or you need more information about how Fromm and Rockwell can help support your food and beverage operation or answer your questions, uh, we'd be happy to support that. Todd included his contact information. I know uh, people on the call have a Fromm sales representative that they stay in touch with. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, Todd can be accessed through them if you have really technical questions that they can't answer. Um, so we appreciate it. Uh, we're here to support you on your journey towards an efficient and resilient manufacturing enterprise. And uh, thanks again for your time. Thanks, Todd. Yes, thank you.